Good morning, live from Sinai Temple. This is Rabbi Ere Sherman on Rabbi on the Sidelines, the podcast or live video where we speak about the intersection of sports and faith. This is an exciting morning because this is our first live interview. Everybody has been uh, around the country or around the world. We've met with athletes and coaches and managers and producers from uh, Israel, from New York, from Los Angeles, literally around the world. But this morning, we are joined live by Danny Menken. Danny is the founder of Hey Jude Productions, the producer of many films, an Israeli Academy Award winner. We were grateful to have Danny here a couple of uh, years ago to uh, screen On the Map, the story of Israel's 1977 EuroLeague Championship and what it meant not just in the basketball world, but also in the entire world for the Jewish people in the state of Israel. Danny, it's so good to see you. How are you doing? Hi, thank you, Erez. It's a pleasure being here. Yeah, good morning and nothing like being in person, nothing like it. That is true. We don't have to uh, have any uh, latency issues, and Zoom. we can. Yeah. Yes, you're, that is you're true. You're mute. You're whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about sports. We're going to talk about faith. We're going to talk about movie making. But really, the crux of what we do is talk about storytelling. So how did you get into this business of storytelling, not just in sports, but in sharing, inspiring stories? That some of these stories you share. You can't make these stories up. Yeah. How do you get into the business? Look, so maybe like you, I wanted to be one of them. I wanted to be a basketball player. It's still trying. And, uh, and sometimes I'm still trying. Now I moved to tennis. <laughs> I had a big episode that I really wanted to be a soccer player. And I was, I was certain that I will be a really good soccer player. I still think that way. But the reality was different. And when I finished my service in the army, they opened uh, the sport channel in Israel. And there was a saying, if you can't, you know, uh, beat them, report on them, you know. <laughs> so I joined the sport channel and it was just the beginning of something new in Israel because it was the beginning of more channels. We always have just one channel. Yes. Channel one. That, that's it. That's all you've seen. You could zip, zip, it's zip. hard these days to find which channel these games are on. Fox Sports 1, ESPN, ESPN 2, ACC Network. It's, it's tough. In Israel, you could zap and then go to the Middle East and watch wrestling and then go to Jordan and watch Arabic movie, <laughs> which we have also done sometimes, and then go back to Channel 1. And then when the sport channel came about, I joined because I felt that if I'm not going to be one of them, and I'm going to tell the story. Because for your question, I always felt like sport is mostly a story. Mm -hmm. You know, it, a fascinating story. And even now when I'm making other films, just straight narrative films, I always tell the folks I work with and the editors, it should be like a basketball game. We should keep score. You know, what's, you know, what's the score, how much time left uh, to any movie? And, and sport has it. So I was a reporter at the Sport Channel, then in Channel 2. I joined, joined one of the legendary uh, broadcasters in Israel, Yoram Marbel, and Alex Giladi. They formed the, the soccer, moved over there. And I did not even know what I'm doing. I just had the love and the passion for that, and I became a director for films. It's funny that you said sport or films have the same thing about sports, right? It's the halftime, it's what's the score. And the same is so true with religion, mm -hmm. right? And as religion has met entertainment, and as we stream services, right? You don't just show up at halftime. You come for the whole game. Or if you show up at halftime, you have to figure out what happened in the first quarter. <laughs> and we've had to figure that out as well when we did a production for our High Holy Days. What story were we going to tell for the people that usually are not in these pews anyway? Um, and that, that analogy between religion and sports, and really it's not just that. It's storytelling and where people come into the story and also what you want them to take out. You know, when I give a sermon, people say, I, what the message that I think people are going to get the next day 
it's a completely different message of what the people actually received at home. So the athletes that you have seen, and you've seen many, many high-level elite elite athletes, do they understand in that moment that they are part of the story? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you not only a, regarding to the story, I can tell you more about what you just um, spoke about. They, the, the top athlete that I faced, and I was always fascinated in, that, in this aspect, uh, understood that there is a spirit more than just being a sport guy. There is something spiritual about what they do and the fact that they need to be in the zone. I mean, a lot of athletes are talking about being in the zone, that all the, the basket looks as big as the ocean. Everything, all the stars will align together. I mean, I love when it happens to me when I when I make a film, I'm sure you're happy mm -hmm. about it mm -hmm. when you conduct a service mm -hmm. and then oh, suddenly you're in the zone, you're in the moment, nothing, everything stops. Mm -hmm. And I'm always fascinated about the athletes because they need to find it and bring it on. So the biggest ones, you know, uh, how did we call Michael Jordan? We called Absolutely. him God, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, <laughs> sorry. I'm, oh, I'm, we're in the chapel. It's a good word. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's how people in Israel, you know, uh -huh. call him, you know, and, and, and all, all over the world, you know. So I was always fascinated about that and about um, conflict sometimes between mm. the fact that you as a spiritual person, you're trying to bring a story to the world. You understand that maybe you're doing something that is bigger than just sport, like basketball, like what I show in on the map about yes. Cal Brody. Yes. Or, for example, another wonderful friends of friend of mine uh, that you have spoken to, Tamir Goodman. Of course, the you Jewish know? Jordan. Yes, he the was on Jewish the show. Jordan. Yes. So I made a movie about him to Channel Two, and I was fascinated because he realized that it's not only the basket that mm -hmm. he's making, he has something bigger mm -hmm. to bring to the world. So I was always, you know, struck by it. And, and that's where On The Map came about. That's where my new film, Olsi, is about. It's, so it's let, a bigger stage. Let's go to On The Map for just a moment because uh, we've been there, done that in a beautiful way, and now this is almost like 2.0 On The Map. But on the map, for those of you who have not watched it, you need to check it out. I believe it's on Amazon Prime. Um, the story of that team, 1977, and I remember because you said the Arut Echad, there's only one station. And I believe that Yitzhak Rabin was going to resign as prime minister of Israel, but decided he couldn't do it at that moment because the entire country was watching this team try to beat Russia. Uh, I mean... <laughs> The reason I'm now uh, writing a script based on, on the map is because I found out that I could have never invented that. That's the beauty about documentaries sometimes, that they are bigger than life. Everything happened that year. Yes, Rabin resigned the day of the game. Tal Brody's father is in a hospital two days before of the game. He has no ticket to go back to <laughs> Belgrade. I mean, uh, what more can I invent? Sharansky is there in Russia when they play against the Russians and, and, and he's talking to the KGB about, you know, Tal Brody putting, you know, the basketball team on the map by beating the Russians. Uh, Moshe Dayan comes and shakes the hand, you know, for the, you know, for the team in every game. It's kind of like it is the force gump of Israel's yeah. history through the journey of that basketball team. And Tal Brody's famous line, after I saw that film, I gave a sermon about it, in fact, the... Uh, we are on the map, not just in basketball, but for everything. What was that moment? What did he mean, aval halakol? We are on the map for everything. How did that change the image of Israel off the court? So there are many aspects to it. First, you know, many folks around the world don't even know where Israel is. I mean, we are like, like nothing. We are like mm -hmm. a, a dot. We're making a lot of noise, but we're, we're a small dot. That's one thing. The second thing is uh, after Yom Kippur War, everyone understood that there are many countries, most of our neighbors, they did not want Israel to be mm. on the map. So on the verge of recovering from the Yom Kippur War, when the country is really in, in, in post-trauma, from that, from those events, Tal Brody wins the Russians, 
that actually don't want to play against Israel. They don't recognize the states of Israel. And he says this line that just came out from heaven. That's it. <laughs> it is, you know, and <laughs> I mean, sometimes the, the teammates are joking. Oh, you prepared that line. Don't tell us that. You no, know. he said, no, I didn't. I had the microphone. Alex Giladi came with the microphone and I just, and it just came out of me. And that moment, in many ways, changed sport. Mm -hmm. It changed Maccabi Tel Aviv. It became one of the biggest basketball club outside of the NBA. But many people say that it really changed the country mm -hmm. because the country went from one generation to the other. Mm -hmm. Now we are not the underdog anymore. And that was a big, big moment for, for Israel. And then it gets to the next film because, of course, Tal Brody became a legend in the Jewish community, but then Alsi Perry. Before we talk about Alsi, we're going to watch the trailer. So uh, we'll see the trailer for Alsi, the new film. Directed and produced by Danny Menken. Let's watch the trailer. Where do I start my story? If somebody wrote it, people may say it's not true. Maybe fiction or animation. It never felt real to me. I always knew one thing that I wanted to tell you my story. The way it is, with the good and the bad. So where do I start? Alsi says it's a story that he can't make up. What is this story of Alsi Perry? Who is this guy that becomes part of the EuroLeague, but then makes just a much bigger difference? And in fact, not only does he make a difference in Israel, but Israel makes a difference in his life. <laughs> Look, I mean, what is beautiful about documentaries and the reason why I'm now turning them into narrative is the fact that, you know, you could not invent. Ozzy was the last guy to be cut from the Knicks. He played with Phil Jackson, uh, Earl Monroe, you know, all, all, all these guys. And, and suddenly, with no job, and, 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 and um, nowhere to go, actually. And Try to move over here a little. Yeah, we'll go okay. here. <laughs> That's good. All, all suddenly find himself uh, playing in Israel. Now, for him, he, uh, the last place he thought he would be is Israel. Uh-huh. Now, you talk about stories that are bigger than life. I'll, I'll rewind for a second to the day Olsi was born. Yeah, yes. And his mom doesn't find a hospital yes. for him. And the only place she finds is Beit Israel. In Newark, New Jersey. In, in New York, New Jersey. And that's where Olsi realized, fast forward later, that his destiny was to be in Israel. And when he makes this unbelievable season with Maccabi Tel Aviv, Really thanks to him, because Jews are known for a lot of things. Jumping high and taking rebounds is not one of them. There's that famous line in the movie Airplane, right? When they, uh, they ask for some short reading, and then they give the, the, uh, <laughs> the passenger a small book called Jews and Sports. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Ozzy Perry um, is really making the difference at the game against Jessica Moscow. Suddenly, they cannot just go and dunk on all the Jews, <laughs> Jewish players out, out there. And Maccabi Tel Aviv are winning the, the European uh, basketball. And then he also falls in love with the top model of Israel. Mm. And he decides that he's going to come and be one of us, one of the country, which was like, what? You are not, he's getting an offer to play in the Golden State that year. And he says, no way, I am staying in Israel. And he lives in Israel until today. Ramat Khan, right? He lives, yeah, in Ramat Gan with his, you know, uh, new uh, significant other girlfriend, which is, you know, uh, another wonderful story. He's totally Israeli, you know. So you said one of us, because I think that's really important in this story. That, and we're going to look at a clip that when you were interviewing him in Ramat Gan, I believe it was a year ago, when Alsi Perry grew up in America, he wasn't one of us because it was a period of segregation. You spoke about Beth Israel and Newark. He was welcomed 
divinely, if you wish, by the Jewish community. So let's look at this quick clip of Alsi Perry speaking about what it was like to grow up in America and how he realized that he was making the right decision to move to Israel. Right uh, immediately, uh, 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 as I arrived to Israel, I, I felt the difference. Uh, America, uh, I'm going to tell you, that, it, it, it wasn't uh, kind and it wasn't nice. I, I was born and raised in America during a very difficult time. It's called the Jim Crow era, uh, where racism was at its highest level. So it was America to me wasn't a nice place to grow up in. My, for my parents and my, and, and my ancestors, it, it wasn't nice. And to come here and to be respected and to look at not as someone a uh, 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 black or, or another race, but to be respected as who I am and what I am, to me was something uh, unbelievable. So I knew right away, immediately, that this is the place that I want to lay my hat. My dad always told me, he said, son, you have to lay your hat where you're welcome, where you're loved, and where you're respected. So I chose to lay, lay my hat here in Israel, where I'm looked, at, looked upon as a human and not as something else. That's an amazing story. In 1977, he wasn't looked upon as a human in this country of the United States of America. But he goes to Israel, the place where people think nobody is welcomed, and there he's welcomed. Maybe you can share some insight on what that journey was like for him. Yeah, you know what? It was the first time for Olsi that people did not look at his color. I mean, they did. Of course. But not in that way. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, also, he is a hero. Mm -hmm. He's Olsi Perry. And that's a big difference, you know. And he's dating the top model of Israel. And he's winning again the European Championship. And he becomes one of the best and biggest and, and, and the most talented team Maccabi has ever had with Mickey Berkovich, with Lou Silver, Jim Boatride, first year with Tal Brody. I mean, so he suddenly, the dream that he had playing in the NBA was replaced with a bigger dream of becoming a legend in a country that he never even heard about and then he realized that's my destiny that's where i was born mm -hmm. so he's changing and um, his name to elisha ben avraham yeah. he's becoming jewish there is also some procedures that we're not going to talk about but it's pretty funny that's a fascinating yes you'll check out the clip about <laughs> brit milah and entering the covenant because it was also a, yeah. a moment to a destiny yeah exactly <laughs> and a funny <laughs> moment and uh, when he's on the top of his game, suddenly uh, there is a game against Real Madrid. One channel, everybody's watching, and Ossi doesn't show up. Oh, wow. And then uh, we realized that, you know, the pressure was too much for him. He was afraid that his career will be over. And then what? Because he was born in a place that it's either basketball or to be part of the gang. Mm -hmm. Now that basketball is over... You know, the demons are chasing after him again. And without spoiling too much, the movie will come out to the theater in LA. November 18th, right? November 12th. November 12th. November 12th. And, and we're going to have screenings here. And please come to my website, heyjuteproductions.com, and we'll be happy to share with you and come to your community with the film. Uh, but, but uh, you know, then the drama is picking up because, you know, he's starting to involve with the wrong people, wrong things, and he has to go through a whole circle of redemption to get out of it. Uh, Ten years in jail wow. uh, that nobody in Israel knows where he is until suddenly surprises everybody and comes back. And I don't want to spoil too much more than that because there is a lot more to this. I want to back up for a moment two words that seem to be distinct but come up together in the story it's racism on one hand and anti-semitism on the other if i was speaking to a jewish player tal brody on that team i would ask him did you face anti-semitism when you were playing in russia but then for alsi perry i would say did you face racism when you were playing in israel how are these two ideas that today are even more prevalent than when we spoke on on the map a couple of years ago how do these ideas come out? And what are you trying to teach, not just the Jewish community and not the black community, but the world, that we can 
overcome these fears, maybe through sports? I mean, Olsi is the bridge because he is an African-American and a Jew, a big Zionist, a love, he loves Israel. Um, but, you know, yes, he faced, he faced both challenges. You know, he saw, you know, anti-Semitism because he has been in Israel and he saw the Russians that don't want to play against Maccabi Tel Aviv because they are Israel and Israel should not exist in 1977. And he has faced racism in his childhood. So in many ways, he tells that part of the story. But the beauty about sport is that you can bring those stories to life and you can spread messages of mm -hmm. hope and love and unity um, through basketball, through, you know, with the ball. You know, we've shown, uh, I hope, you know, with our film, with On the Map, and I would all see a beautiful side of Israel that people don't really know about, but whoever comes and visit know that that's the main thing that exists over it's there. It's so fascinating over this year that I've been able to interview people who I watch on TV, broadcasters, athletes, etc. When you really speak to them, they don't want to talk about sports. That's their day job. But what the sports, as we are talking about today, the narrative that sports brings to this world, that's what they want to speak about, what it's doing for them and what also they are doing for others as well. We're going to look at one more clip about Alsi Perry and his uh, bridge between Israel, America, between black and white. I said before, I, I was telling you before, I, I was born and raised in a very difficult and different time in America. I didn't have a, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have somebody's... Uh, to guide me through a, a very difficult time. Uh, both of my parents were from super rural North Carolina. And, uh, and, um, and after I did the research of my, on, on my family uh, heritage and found out that uh, I'm, the, my, my, I'm the great, great grandson and great grandson of a former slave. So my, all my history going back, uh, my family history going back, all the way back is from there, from my great, great uh, grandparents in 1700s, the 1750s on up. That's my history. And uh, so it hasn't been kind to me or my parents. And that's how my, how my parents uh, grew as well. So it's been a tough time for us. And, and uh but we survived and we struggled and we uh, we persevered. So uh, no, I didn't have a mentor. The only thing I had was God's blessing for me to be two meters at 13 and a half years old and gave me the desire to be the best basketball player that I could be. And that's what I did. I, I, I went after that as, as, with everything that I had inside of me. So you know he's Israeli because he's saying it's two meters, two meters not exactly, seven That's feet. exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> I had to do a, a <laughs> translation in my head. But Avadim Hayinu, we were slaves. Lafaro B'mitzrayim with Pharaoh in Egypt. That's his story. We were slaves. And you mentioned the word redemption. Yeah. This is sports and faith here. Gu'ula. If you look at our tradition, it's sort of three things, three ideas that are always circulating around. There's creation, there's revelation, and redemption. God creates. God reveals. And then we go through some type of challenge, as Alsi just spoke about, and then we're redeemed. Maybe you can just talk about a little about the redemption with his daughter and reunion and how his family was broken. And I was reading about how they have come together based on the story. You know, some people ask me sometimes, what is the main theme about my movies? I have here 39 Pounds of Love. That was a movie that was on HBO. And, and, and I have another one, Dolphin Boy. And I've been asked that sometimes, and I never had an answer. And now... When I'm getting older a little bit, <laughs> I start thinking that it is a, the sense of a family mm. because it is something that I have in all of my films, including on the map that, you know, it became, the team became a family, the country became a family. And that's what Olsi found, mm. found out, you know, the strength of the family because he makes a choice to come to Israel, but he has to leave his son oh, wow. uh, in America. So his girlfriend at the time... Was, Go from your country to the land that I will show you. She was pregnant and he's coming in until today and I show it in the film. His son, Ossie Perry Jr. has, you know, uh, some resentments because mm -hmm. of that time. And when he's in Israel and he sees the family, 
he understands that he still has one daughter that he has, hasn't seen. It's a daughter from a relationship that he had when he was in parole in jail in North Carolina. Oh, wow. She was a teenager. I mean, I followed him for a few years. And he wanted to reach out to her. He said, I wanted to correct the wrong I've done mm. before. And part of it is to become a father. Mm. And I can tell you that I was already in the edit room that he calls me. And he tells me she reached out. She reached out to his sister. She, she was 18. 18. She was uh, in college in North Carolina. And we went there. He came from Israel. I came from L.A. with, with the film crew. And that was, that was for me the moment, you know, that the movie had a full circle. You were there the moment that they reunited. Yes, yes. And, wow. and, and it is, you know, in the film. You know, I have no problem doing that spoiler because um, the movie has so much more. But it's one of those things that Aussie have learned in Israel. So think about it. He went to play basketball. Right. Tal Brody gave up on the NBA because yep. he went to play basketball in Israel. But through basketball, they have done so much more. And to bring back to what we started, I mean, I feel like there are people that could have made through sport so much more impact mm -hmm. than just winning a game, just getting a title. And that's what I'm... So, you know. two questions. One, what was Alsi's reaction when you reached out to him saying, I want to tell your story? Because you sort of mentioned some, you know, he has a yeah. private and a public life. How did you convince him that his story needed to be told to us and to yeah. maybe also to the to the black community as well? So, believe it or not, I have made my first film in 1999. And it was also a basketball film. It you were like Israeli 10. Hoop Dreams. Yeah, I was minus five. Okay, good. And I've okay. made my first film. <laughs> and since then... I told Olsi I want to make the film about him because he never told the story, his side of the story, to what happened, uh, why he disappeared, mm -hmm. what happened in jail, what happened to him with drugs, his problems. He did not want to talk about it. So it took me 20 years to chase after him. I actually wanted to make a feature film narrative, which I still have the screenplay for that. But during that time, he suddenly tells me the story of the daughter and it starts sharing things with me. So I'm documenting is as a documentary documentarian so it was slowly slowly it was tough for him to share that story um, he wanted to run away from it he was embarrassed from what has happened because he wanted people to still remember him as a hero now the people in israel still remember him right. as a hero that's hard in you can see that go everybody out embraces him you know and when he walks now on the shuk in israel everybody loves him mm -hmm. But for him, it was tough. Do you think he was a trendsetter for other African-American players to come to Israel? I mean, in this generation, it's Amari Stoudemire, right? Not everybody converts to Judaism. And, you know, Amari has a different story of looking into his past and realizing that there's the, you know, Judaic uh, genetics. But is somebody like an Amari influenced by somebody like an Alsi um, when Alsi said, I didn't have a mentor, right? What do you see in terms of what's happening in the sports world today in Israel, where it's basically second to the NBA if you're going to go to Europe? Um, is there a connection? Oh, yeah. Alsi Perry was the first African-American ambassador to bring more basketball players, you know, because, you know, he was, you can see in his game, he was a legit NBA player, period. End of story. If Folks will not watch his game, or they will, you know, or will watch my movie. <laughs> they can see he's kind of like a Kevin Durant, you know. He's, you know, uh, six ten, right? What is it? Uh, Two ten. Yeah. Convert it, please, and yeah. tell us. <laughs> <laughs> and and he's shooting really well from outside, and he has a soft hand. He takes rebounds. He's smart, you know. He is just an incredible basketball player. And then he finds himself, you know, playing in Israel. So other... And by the way, Israel 1977, as I've heard Tal Brody speak in person many times, right? He tells the story of like, you know, getting changed in the locker room, which was basically like a porta potty in the desert. 
Uh, this was not NBA locker rooms where these guys gave up their dreams for. When Tal Brody came to Israel, there was not even a roof. Yeah. I mean, they were cows walking yeah. in when, <laughs> when they play. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm showing that, you know, in, in my movie. It, it's like, it's, it's a different world. And I'm talking about All-American. Uh -huh. You know, somebody who is, you know, is a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. You know, an American playmaker for the, for the American basketball team at a roommate of Bill Walton, mm -hmm. <laughs> Bill Walton. I said, well, "Why are you going to Israel? Exactly. <laughs> where, where is Israel?" So, to your question, I mean, Olsi Perry was kind of a breakthrough. So, from Olsi Perry to Amara Stodimar, I think there is a, a wonderful through line mm. that takes the story of African American coming and impacting our country, and in many ways, the country are impacts them. Mm -hmm. So in a couple of weeks, I have a professor of Jewish history, uh, Professor Jeffrey Gurak from Yeshiva University is going to be joining me virtual because he's in New York. Um, but he wrote a book called Judaism or um, um, Judaism's Encounter with Sports or sorry, American Jews Encounter with Sports, right? And here it's Americans Encounter with Israeli Sports. What about the Israel-America connection? Um, how do you see that building bridges as well when in a time right now, literally right now, young people say Israel's not for me for whatever reasons, whether it's political reasons or whatever, how can something like this bring them back and say Israel can be for all of us? Just like Elsie said, I felt welcome there. I mean, you can see, I mean, in on the map and um with the story of Olsi, the sense of community that Israel has. You know, that's something that can never be replaced. Mm -hmm. You know, we, uh, the way I personally, because it's funny, I, I tell the joke that Olsi moved to Israel and I moved to America. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, you can take yourself out of Israel. You cannot take Israel out of you in so many ways. And Israel is really like the family Mm -hmm. And we'll always be there as the family mm -hmm. that when times are tough, when it's hard, and Olsi Perry was 10 years in jail, mm -hmm. the only place wow. he was dreaming about and wanted to go back to was Israel. Wow. That's where he wanted to. You know, he, he's, he's American. You know, he had a, a new girlfriend here and, and, and he was just dreaming about going back to his home. And he wants to be in Israel, uh, and he lives there until today. You know, there is a famous superstar, like the Bruce Springsteen of Israel, is Shlomo Artzi. Mm, of course. You know, everybody knows Shlomo Artzi. So when Olsi comes to Kesaria, Shlomo Artzi <laughs> comes with a microphone to Olsi, and he tells, them, <laughs> tells everybody in the audience, look, look at this guy. You know, we had no choice. We were born here. We're stuck here. Mm -hmm. He chose yes, <laughs> to yes. be with us. And the reason he chose it is because he felt, you know, this is where he belongs. So no matter where we are in the world, we do belong mm -hmm. in Israel. Mm -hmm. And it's like a family that can also annoy you. You know, I can understand those young kids that are questioning things about Israel. You can have wonderful argument with Israel for all the reasons in the world. It's tough, uh -huh. but it's like being... With, with, with your family. There is a saying, if you think you're enlightened, spend a week with your parents. Yep, yep, for sure. <laughs> so that's how I call it, Israel. You think you're enlightened. Or for COVID, spend two years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you think you're enlightened, go to Israel and spend a few years over there. But exactly. uh, again, that's, I think, the reason why so many American athletes, you know, are really in love with Israel. Talk to Anthony Parker. Mm -hmm. You know, um, talk to... See, Tamir Goodman. Absolutely. Is, he, he lives David now Blue. In Israel. David Blue, uh, Coach Blatt. I mean, those yep. are people that could be anywhere, mm -hmm. but there is a spark of joy and spirit and things that they have done in Israel. And there is a reason why the Maccabees, because at the end of the day, it's the story of the Maccabees, mm -hmm. that team, and have made so many miracles. So my last question is, what about the sports world in America, right? So, for instance, Kyrie Irving, when he's on TikTok during the last Israel-Gaza crisis, he says, I can't focus on basketball because I'm focused on what's going on in Gaza. Can your audience also be the athletes in this country 
who are just simply uneducated about Israel and see how sports can also impact there? Or is this just for the Jewish community or just for the black community? Who is your audience and so, who can we tell the story to? I have um, a foundation called On The Map Foundation. I mean, you can go to heyjuteproductions.com to see our trailers because it's all about, we said sporty story, all about telling good stories out of Israel. And when Hollywood Reporter, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, or Bill Walton, David Stern, and Jeff Van Gandhi and, uh, are, are, are talking about where the hell did you bring that story? <laughs> this is where uh, our story with On The Map are, is crossing bridges right. to other people because there are beautiful stories that come out of Israel. Same for the story of Olsi. When you see a beautiful story coming out of Israel, how the country fell in love with an African-American player that changed the country and how he fell in love mm -hmm. with the country and of course fell in love with Tammy, the top model of Israel. Any good story has to have a love story in it. Mm -hmm. And the movie right now is winning, uh, we just won Barcelona, Paris, Mumbai, uh, New Zealand, all of them are international film festivals. Mm -hmm. So you see that those stories are crossing uh, from the Jewish world and are bringing you know, non-political positive message right. from Israel. Yeah, we are not perfect. Mm -hmm. I always say that, you know, because, you know, I go to speak in so many places, in universities, and, and, I, and I always love to speak on behalf of my country. But the one thing I will say, you know, we are not perfect. But, but, but nobody is. That's important but, to know. But, but also nobody is, and, and, and also see who we are, you know, and we are waking up in the morning and, and, uh, and praying for peace. You know. So actually, you said something that I want to conclude with. Bahavienu le shalom meyarbak and fota aretz. Before we say the Shema every single day, we say that Bahavienu le shalom that we should bring peace meyarbak and fota aretz from all four corners of the earth. Alsi is a story that I think does that. Like you said, he falls in love with the country. We fall in love with him. Alsi is a story that needs to be told. Alsi is a story that will be told. I know you've already won the award of the Sinai Temple Film Festival before you've even screened it here. We're looking forward to do that uh, this coming year. If you have not seen On the Map, please check that out before you check out Alsi, which will be coming to theaters November 18th. Um, and we are just very excited to continue our connection on Rabbi on the Sidelines, the official first live interview with Danny Menken of Hey Jude Productions on the map, 39 pounds of love, so many other films. Check out heyjudeproductions.com. Again, Danny Menken with the new documentary of Alsi. Check it out, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great day.
sad. 